Welcome to our venue, venue uh, recorded live in studio. We just want to record them with a few people able to clap all distance from each other, but we just want to let you know that, hey, you're a part of something much bigger, and, um, and you're not alone wherever you are right now, wherever you're joining us. Uh, God has something uh, in your life that he wants to do in your life today, but also because it's part of a bigger picture, and it's going to be amazing when you look back to this time in your life, what God has been able to do even in the midst of crisis. We are studying the life and times of Gideon. Now, if you think whatever you're dealing with right now, it is nothing compared to what Gideon had to deal with in his life, what his family was afraid of, what his sons and daughters would be living in fear of. And I want to say if God can meet Gideon, then God can meet you. And I also want to say that if God can make Gideon out of Gideon, God can make new you out of old you. And I really wanted to speak that to your life. This sermon is, is the final sermon. Last week was Mother's Day, and I thought that it was incredible what we did in Mother's Day, even though we're recording this before Mother's Day. I still trust in the Holy Spirit. And, uh, but this week is the final week that I'm preaching about the life and times of Gideon. In a, dream, uh, in a, in a sermon I've called Weird Dreams. <laughs> Who has weird dreams out there? My wife has the weirdest dreams sometimes. She... She, she told me just last night before we record this, she told me, like, I dreamt that she woke up in a bit of a panic because she said, I dreamt that I stole the neighbor's cell phone, the na- a knife, and a truck from the neighbors. And I had to get it back before it, they noticed that it was missing. And I'm like, you're a crazy person, and nobody told me this before I got married to you. And so there are some things that it's good that your spouse didn't know about you before they got married to you. And my wife has weird dreams sometimes. Um... When I dream, they're perfectly normal dreams. And whenever I dream, I dream that I can fly. Matrix style. Like, rage against the machine. You know what I'm talking about. I dream that that the sun is going down and it's getting dark and there's a mission that I need to do, but I can fly and nobody knows that I can. And that's what I dream about, that I can fly. It's an incredible dream and it's exhilarating. And every time I dream it, I'm like, I knew it. I can fly. I've always known that I can fly. I had a weird dream the other day. Um... The, the, one of the main pastors in the movement that we belong to called ARC, or the Association of Related Churches, his name is Pastor Chris Hodges. And I had a dream the other day that, that we were at a cabin somewhere, and then I happened to walk onto his back patio area where he was staying, and he was out there in the morning wearing, a, get this, a bathrobe, and he was out on his, and his, I mean, and this guy has a church of like tens and tens of thousands of people. It's a massive church. But here we were out in some cabin somewhere, and he's out on the back porch wearing a, a, a bathrobe. And, and he was super emotional about things, which if you knew Pastor Chris, he's, he's not really like a guy who cries a lot, I think. But um, he was like softly weeping to himself. And, and I was there, can you imagine, this is my dream, I'm there consoling somebody who's crying softly to themselves. <laughs> and if you know me at all, you're like, that is the wrong dream, man, that is not you at all. But that was the dream that I had. It's funny that some of our life dreams make about as much sense to heaven as our dream dreams do. Your life dream, what, what, what do you dream about becoming? What do you dream that your life could be all about? The seed in your current life dream, I'm going to suggest that there's a part of it that will be heaven's dream for you, but there will be a whole lot of it that will be your stuff. So, you know, can, will I be able to fly someday? Well, technically I can fly in an airplane. Maybe spiritually I can fly. But, but there's a part of it that's true, like I'll be able to fly, but I'm not going to be able to like grow wings and fly. So there's a part of your life dream that belongs to heaven, and then there's a part that just belongs to you, and it's kind of weird. (laughs) I'm just telling you. God needs to prune you until you desire his dream for your life. So when God works on your character, he's like, yeah, 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 that's great, but most of your dream has to do about you, and the dream that I give you won't be like that. And so he's like, I need to prune you until you can handle my dream that I have for your life. But the dream that you have when you're young, you know, it needs to kind of grow up. And so the dream that, um, there, was a, there was a kid that I know, his name was Mike, and when he was young, you know, most young boys, they want to be like a policeman or a, a fireman or something like that. Mike's dream was a little different because Mike wanted to be a fire truck. <laughs> so he was asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, I want to be a fire truck. 
Now, now, some of our life dreams are immature like that because for Mike to actually be a fire truck would be quite painful if you think about it. If God would make Mike into a fire truck, sure, he'd be red and shiny, but it would be a painful process for him, for people to throw a bunch of hoses on him and then jump on his back and have, you know, ride him to the fire. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes your dream is so out of touch with heaven's dream for your life that it could never fulfill you even if it would happen and it would be very painful. So how do we get close to God's dream for your life? See, even the religious leaders of the day when Jesus came thought, great, the Messiah is here, but he didn't come the way that they thought that he would. And they thought that he was there to release them from the the bondage of Rome when he came to release them from the bondage of sin, which was much greater than Rome. But when Jesus comes to you, it won't be in the way that you initially thought because you and I initially, we, we, we don't think our dreams have to do with our lives and they can be very small and very selfish. But God's dream for your life will have many revisions, not because God doesn't know what he wants to do, but because you can only hear a little bit at a time without twisting the dream to become all about you again. Here's what I want you to think of today as we open the sermon. God's dream always includes other people and is for other people. Now, anything that you dream about right now, can I just, I'll just save you a lot of time and a lot of years of wasted life if all you want to do is make five million bucks and that's all you want to do in your life and have more than enough money than you need, you will not die happy because your dream has to include other people and be for other people. You were made to have purpose and your purpose is twofold, once again, to connect with God and to connect with people. Any dream that doesn't include God and doesn't include people is not God's dream for your life and it will not make you happy. In fact, you cannot find your purpose without helping somebody else find their purpose. But when you help somebody else find their purpose in the realm of heaven, then God helps you find your purpose and that's how that works. You're welcome. I just saved you a lot of years of your life. Now here's another thought. If your dream can be fulfilled in your own strength or in your own lifetime, it's too small of a dream. When God dreams, it's not just about you. It's, it's about if you have children or if you don't have children, it's about the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. We cannot in Canada fall for the short-minded thinking of like, you know, government just bail us out right now. Just know we have to think about our children and their children and their children. Like we have to make long-term decisions because we can't just be dreaming about uh, having enough food to eat this month. We have to start thinking in longer terms and in more disciplined terms. Now, God will only be held responsible to fulfill his dream for your life. Now, can I suggest that the angriest I've been at God, I'll just be honest, the angriest I've been at God is when he's not fulfilling my dream for my life. But God can only be held responsible to make his promises come true, his dream come true in his timing. Now, I look back at the faithfulness of God and say, thank God that you didn't make that dream come true because that dream actually would have wrecked me and it was only about me, really. But what I want to say is you have to understand that if you're deeply angry or bitter in your life right now, that part of that may be that you are angry because God is not helping you fulfill your dream for your life, but God is like, I have a much better dream for your life that will actually fulfill you and actually leave a legacy to the people coming behind you. Now, when, when I was um, younger and, and out of high school, I dreamt of becoming a musician, like a full-time musician. Now, now, you know that I'm musical, and that sort of helps. Um, it helps to be a preacher who can also sing at least a little bit okay. Yeah, you're a great singer. Okay, thanks. No, thank you. Stop. Okay. Um, it helps to be a, a, a preacher who can do both, but, but some, means just aren't, aren't, some dreams just aren't meant to be. So I, I thought to myself, well, I have maybe enough talent to do that, but being a, a, like a well-known musician is not always about talent. I have enough drive to do that. I knew that I had enough drive, but the reality of it was, I think that had God fulfilled that dream for my life, which I think was my dream for my life, um, it feeds into a bigger dream for my life now that is actually God's dream. But had God given me that, I don't think that my life as a traveling musician would have been great. Or for my family. Like, I think that I probably would have messed that whole life up. And I'm being pretty honest about myself there. 
Um, <laughs> why, Pastor, what are you into? I'm not into anything because I'm not a musician. Have you ever talked to a musician? <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, I want to say something. Look, I love creative people, but I also love handlers, and we put the two of them together because I can't go for a steady diet of creative people. Like, I love you guys, but not everything is rainbows and unicorns, you know? <laughs> You're laughing, right? But have you ever talked to a drummer? I'm just, no, my, one of my daughters is a drummer, and she's amazing, but I'm just saying there's, there's this creative dream that was inside of me, but God's like, you know what? I want you to do something different with your life, and I'm glad that I did. So the place where, where my own worship team here at the church kicked me off the worship team because they're like, you have better things to do right now, and we got it, and I'm like... Really? Yeah, but they did. But no, I was okay because that wasn't God's dream for my life. That was just my dream for my life. And I was glad to serve when I needed to serve there. But now I can do what God really has called me to do. Now, what has God really called you to do? Um, Nobody in the history of the human race has ever had a dream for their life in an immature form that had a lot of sacrifice attached to it and a lot of pain. When you dream of having a big company, what you don't dream of is all the people that you're going to have to fire one day. Like, you never think about that. You never think about, like, oh, my goodness, we could lose it all. That, 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 you know, business owners wake up and fear every single day that they're going to make a decision that's going to cost everybody, you know, their kid's college fund. And what you just dream about the dream, but you don't dream about all the other things that are going to be a part of that dream. You know, Joseph had that dream that his brothers hated him for, and he's like, oh, the sun and the moon and the stars are going to bow down to me. And God's like, yeah, that's the immature version of the dream. That's the last day of the dream, but we got a few years in jail, and we're going to have a, a hard road to get to that dream, because if I want to trust you with a big dream, I have to make you trustworthy. And, and you never think that the dream that God gave you will, will be, uh, have pain and suffering uh, accompanied with it. But if you lived any amount of time on the earth, you'll start realizing, right, dreams have pain and suffering attached that sometimes God doesn't tell you about because you're not mature enough to handle it yet. So God's dream will have a way of weaving the pain and suffering and even the sin and the failure of the past into a beautiful tapestry. Only God can do that. Don't you try to weave sin into your tapestry because you will wreck everything. No, man, it's like spilling paint on a beautiful, you know, like just dumping paint on a beautiful drawing of something. That's what you do when you sin. But I'll tell you, God has a way of of returning the things even that you got wrong in your life. God has a way of making all the suffering and all the pain um, into a beautiful thing where his redemption shines through it. But only in God's dream and only in God's power. All right, Gideon had a dream. They had been under the thumb of the Midianites, and these were a cruel, cruel people for seven years. He had a dream that his sons would not have to live in the same fear that he lived in, that they wouldn't have to grow up in the world that he grew up in. Um, And and Gideon starts his dream like like you and I start our dream, and I don't know what, what it was like when you grew up, and I'm just feeling there's a lot of hurting people out there because of the home that you grew up in or because of the pain that you've experienced, and I just want to say this to you right now. Oftentimes, um, we look at that and we think that that disqualifies us from the dream that God has for us, but it does not. And I'm going to show you as we move along that it does not. But often we're like, God, just send me somebody to get me out of this. So can I say this? Girls, if you grew up without dads or you grew up broken or men or if you were hurt or abused, sometimes you set your expectations on maybe marrying somebody or having a child that you could love that that will help ease the pain and suffering of your past. But can I say, don't fall for the trick of doing that because they can't, they're not God and they can't put the pieces of your life back together. And they cannot give you the dream that God has given you and they don't have the power to make it come true. So what we have to do is we just have to live with the people around us and just be the best that we can, the best versions of ourselves. But we can't fill a box with rocks and make them hold it and say, hey, make all my dreams come true. And it was really bad, so the dream's got to be really good. Only God can do this, and we just need to trust in God in this area. Now, sometimes we say, God, I want my wife to deliver me from the pain of my past. And God's like, no, that's not how that works, and I'm going to show you in the scripture how it actually works. Now, sometimes, can I say this, just as we're thinking about this dream, Sometimes the thing that you notice when you walk into the room is part of the dream that God wants you to, let me give you an example, I'll just, I'm in church world, so. so when I walk into the room, what I notice is the atmosphere of the room, and I notice like, do I feel like the Holy Spirit is here and the Holy Spirit is able to move 
quickly among us. Um, that's what I noticed. So it has to do with things like, it sounds funny, but this is just what my gift is. I, I notice the lighting, and I notice the music, and I notice if people are getting along. So because if, if there's unity, the Spirit of God can come. But if people have their own agendas, and people are, you know what I mean? Like, so my life is built on this, like, okay, we've got to get the Holy Spirit here because the Holy Spirit can do anything. And if the Holy Spirit is here and we build him a, a throne for the Lord our God and then we turn a church service on, like we could do anything and, and God could come and change the lives of people. But we could do everything without that and nothing is going to matter. And so really that's the type of church that we need to build. That's what I notice when I walk into the room. But you know what I don't notice? Is somebody sitting in the corner of the room who's crying. I don't. Unless they're bringing the mood down. <laughs> I don't, you know, I really have to work in this in my life. But you know what's even better? is somebody who has a gift to sit beside that person or the person who's standing outside who doesn't, who can't make it in because they're so scared they don't know what to expect and there's somebody who notices that person and maybe that's you. You just notice them, you just put your arm around them or you just like give them a cup of coffee and like, come on in, you sit by me. And you have a way of just making everything okay for them so that they stay long enough to hear the gospel message, stay long enough to meet Jesus and to start being enveloped in the love of Christ and then all the things that used to scare them would just pull them in and they'd realize, oh, this is where I need to be. That's not my gift, but that's somebody's gift out there. Um, some people are gifted uh, on online just to pull people in, even watching online sermons. They're just super gifted at it. Amy's one of those people. She just pulls people in. I love it. Anyways, um, so Gideon, it says in, in Judges chapter 7, collected the provisions and ram's horns. So this is the third part of the series. If you're just joining us today, join us for the live experience, but then you've got to go back and get the other two. Gideon collected the provisions and ram's horns of the other warriors and sent them home, but he kept the 300 men with him. So a quick recap is they're facing 135,000 Midianites and their allies, 135,000 soldiers, and there's only 300 of them left, right? And so... God's like, the people who are with you send all the people home who are afraid, 22,000 left. Then he's like, if anybody drinks out of their hand and doesn't lap the water like a dog, which is actually in the scripture, then they can go home too and another 10,000 left, you know, just about, except for he's left with 300 people. And it says the Midianite camp was in the valley just below Gideon. So now we're here, this is the, the night before the battle. Are you ready? So whatever you're facing, this might be the, the morning of the battle that God wants you to face. The Lord said, get up. Go down into the Midianite camp, for I have given you victory over them. But then he says this, because he knows who you are, and he knows that you're scared sometimes. He says, but if you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura. Listen to what the Midianites are saying, and you will be greatly encouraged. Then you will be eager to attack. Now, how many people know that only God could do this? Because I'm like part of a band of 300 people, and there's 135,000 people down on the valley. And like, I'm not going to go down there and hear them say something and be super encouraged and then be eager to attack them. Like, that doesn't make any sense to my brain, right? Like, eager to attack them. Like, the odds now are 450 soldiers against one Israelite soldier. There's nothing in me that would be eager to go and down and do that. But something happens, and a man tells another man a dream that he had. And the dream is the key to this whole sermon. The dream is the key to your life this week, right now. So Gideon took Pura down and went down to the edge of the enemy camp. Now sometimes to hear this, you've got to go down to the edge of what you're afraid of. You've got to go right up to the threshold that you're scared of, and you've got to go right into it, and, and God will lead you in there, but man, you've got, to get, you've got to get up on your own two legs and walk there. And the armies of Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east have settled in the valley like a swarm of locusts. I don't know what that looks like, but I assume it's super bad. Um, their camels were like grains of sand on the seashore. Too many to count. I do know what camels look like. Gideon crept up just as one man. Watch the timing of this. Just as one man is telling his companion about a dream. The man said, I had this dream. <laughs> Catch this dream. It's the dumbest dream. Like it's literally dr dumber than stealing your neighbor's truck and cell phone and knife and having to get it back there at a certain time. It's, the, it's dumber than having to fly. It's dumber than meeting Pastor Chris Hodges wearing a, a, a bathrobe and crying on his back deck. Watch this. I had this dream, and in my dream, a loaf of barley bread came tumbling down into the Midianite camp. It hit a tent, turned it over, and knocked it flat. It, this a loaf of barley bread rolls down the hill, hits a tent, knocks it over, or turns it over and knocks it flat. I like that. Hits it, turns it over, knocks it flat. 
His companion answered, me, 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 me. Watch this, watch this. He's like, me, me, me. I know what this means. I know what this means. I know what this means. And this is exactly what you would think that it means. Your dream can only mean one thing. God has given Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite, victory over Midian and all his allies. <laughs> He's like, I got it. Barley loaf, hits a tent, knocks it over, knocks it flat. Oh my goodness, I know what this means. This is super obvious, right guys? God can speak through donkeys and God can speak through your enemies and the very people that come against you sometimes. By their mouths, God will tell you the dream that you're supposed to live by. I'll tell you what, there have been people that have come against me and what the work that God wanted me to do in my life and I'll tell you what, their very words turned against them and actually gave fuel to the fire of God in my life and I actually do the very thing that they said that I would never be able to do because my God was with me and the dream that they had was turned over. I'll tell you, it knocks the tent flat. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, his servant Pierre is like, oh man, we're all going to die. We are so dead. We just came down here to hear about a loaf of barley bread. We're going to die. We're going to die before we even get out of the tent here. Well, I might as well die here tonight in the dark than, you know, live to see it in the morning. When Gideon heard the dream, though, and its interpretation, he bowed his head in worship before the Lord. Right there. Right at the edge of the enemy's camp. Right there. Then he returned to the Israelite camp and shouted, get up. Get up. Up, for the Lord has given you victory over the Midianite hordes. He divided the 300 men into three groups, gave each man a ram's horn and a clay jar with a torch in it, because that's what you would do. That makes loads of sense. Then he said to them, keep your eyes on me. It's very important in this time of crisis. Look, if you're a Christ follower and have something to say, say it. Like fathers in homes, mothers in homes, if your children are afraid, There are times when you say, look at me, look at me. Do I look worried? No, because the Lord, my God, I got a plan. I've heard the dream. I got it. We got it. Relax, 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 relax. God is on our side. He said, keep your eyes on me. When I come to the edge of the camp, just do just as I do. As soon as I and those with me blow the ram's horns or blow the trumpets, blow your horns too all around the entire camp and shout, for the Lord and for Gideon. It was just after midnight, after the changing of the guard, when Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge. Now he split up his, because if you have 300 men and you're going against 135,000, you know, typical warfare, you got to make sure that you make that group a lot smaller. <laughs> Divide them into three groups so that you only got like 100 guys in a group now. Let's go. They blew the ram's horns and broke their clay jars. Then all three groups blew their horns and broke their jars. They held the blazing torches in their left hand and the, get this, so the blazing torches in their left hand and the, the horns in their right hands and they all shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Now you might be a very clever person who's discovered that if I've got a, a torch in this hand and a trumpet in this hand, I'm speaking about a sword but I'm not actually holding one. Am I right? And the very thing that you would use to fulfill God's dream for your life might not be the thing that God wants you to do because if you did it, then you'd tap yourself in the back and be like, I did it. I swung my sword. And God's like, yeah, it's not really about you. They said, this, there's, there's, I could preach a whole sermon just on this. Look, there's three things. There's the torch, there's the trumpet, and there's the sword. The, The essence of leadership, the essence of what beats the enemy There's the torch. There's the holiness and the fire of heaven. There's the torch. There's the trumpet, which is the clear sound that we need in Canada more than we have ever needed it. A clear, follow me and do this. Keep your eyes on me and do this. We need this. We have a leadership vacuum in Canada right now, and I'm telling you from, like, I don't mean government. I mean everywhere. We have a leadership vacuum, but we need God's appointed leaders, men and women who God has called, and when God sees a problem that needs fixing, he calls a person, and then he calls a people to the person, and then the problem gets fixed. That is the only thing that has ever fixed problems. I'm telling you, there's a torch, the holiness and the fire of God. There's the trumpet, the clear sound, and the here's what we do next, guys. And then there's the sword. The sword is the word of God proceeding out of your mouth. The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. 
the, the, it's the word of God. Now, it's not just enough to read the word of God and to get it into your heart. It has to leave out of your mouth. If it stays in your heart, it doesn't do anything in the world around you. It can't just stay here. Some Christians, man, they get so weird and judgmental, and it's so easy for them to, 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 to hate the, the girl who just got an abortion or to hate the person who's addicted or to hate the, the, the person who hurts another person. It's so easy because they're like the, the Dead Sea. All the, all the water comes in and it gets super weird and, and, and salty and it never flows out to anywhere else. And it's so easy to forget what God saved you from that all you do is just blame and you sit in church and we sit in churches and we just get more and more pious and more and more holy and righteous. But I think it's really unholy because we forgot who it was for. Because the dream of God is going to include other people and be about other people and not just be about you going to heaven. Hallelujah. Yeah, we'll go to heaven, but let's go to heaven with some people around us. The word of God can't just enter your heart. Every word of God that he speaks to you, it's to do. It's to speak and it's to go out and do. Then it said this, each man stood at his position around the camp and watched as all the Midianites rushed around in a panic, shouting as they tried to escape. Man, God just kicked over the anthill, just boom. I've never been past an anthill that I haven't kicked over. For my own harm, I just can't not kick an anthill over and go, get back to work, guys. Scurry around, except for there were, there were these anthills when I was in Kenya that they were, like, they were like eight feet tall. I would not kick an anthill that's eight feet tall, man. Those things were dangerous. You could drive your truck into one of those and it'd be like, Indiana Jones, man, you're not coming back. All right, that's an aside. God kicks the anthill over because God can. When the 300 Israelites blew the ram's horns, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their swords. Now, I want to return to the thing that we need to end the sermon on and end the series on, and that is the dream. What is it about the dream of the barley loaf, striking the tent, turning it over and flattening it? What is that dream have to do with Gideon all of a sudden knowing that the dream was going to come true? What does that dream have to do with a battle? What does that dream have to do with anything? And I've been thinking all week long, it's been just bugging me. Like, what is that dream? Why did he get up after hearing that dream that made no sense to his servant and no sense really to like the one guy who was speaking the dream? It made no sense to anybody, but he hears the dream. And look, even if I would go down and hear the one guy say like, oh, this can only mean that Gideon is going to destroy us, and I'm actually Gideon, and I'm outnumbered 450 to 1, I'm still not going to get up and be eager to go to battle. But it was the dream itself, not the interpretation, the dream itself that pulled Gideon in. God had a message hidden in the dream for Gideon, and as soon as Gideon heard it, he knew. Listen, the dream, when God tells you, it might not make sense to the people around you. God sometimes calls children, but if they don't grow up in, in a family um, that's a godly family, or, or, or God gives you a dream in your heart, or maybe you run it out like Joseph did when it's too early and it's just in its seed station, and you run it out to the wrong people at the wrong time, or you get proud about it. But, but see, what happens is God, God tells the dream, and you've got to catch the dream in the right moment. And Gideon hears this dream, and it's about a barley loaf. And the barley loaf strikes a tent and turns it over and knocks it flat. And he's like, uh, he, he got it. See, if the man had had a dream about a warrior rushing down and knocking over a bunch of warriors and killing a bunch of warriors, it still wouldn't have fired up Gideon's heart. It would have just made him proud. But this dream that God, when it comes from God, it's about... It's about other people and it's for other people and Gideon finally realized, I'm the barley loaf. I was called in a wine press, threshing wheat. Every day that I ate, that I ate chaff in my bread, in the loaf of bread that I would eat, every day I would eat that and it would remind me of my slavery and remind me of my sin and remind me of my failure, and remind me that I, I blew up my family, and remind me that I blew up my finances, and remind me that I left a perfectly good church and I shouldn't have. And it reminds me of my failure, and it reminds me of my past, and it reminds me of my servitude to the devil. And he's like, every day I would eat that, I would eat that bread. And he's like, I guess I'm still only a loaf of bread. But sometimes a loaf of bread hurled with enough velocity from the hand of God can hit a tent and turn it over and knock it flat. And he's like, this was not about me being a glorious warrior. This was about me being a nobody 
doing something that I despise doing in a wine press, and that's where the Holy Spirit found me, and that's who I'm always going to be in my own sight. But that loaf of bread thrown with enough pace and enough velocity and your life thrown by the hand of God with enough purpose can reach into your neighborhood and could do something that you never imagined that it could do. Your life from where it began and its brokenness. Look, the dream does not heal the brokenness, but I'm telling you what, the very thing the very platform that you stand on to fulfill the dream will be the platform of pain that you came from. The very thing that hurts you the most, the very pain that you suffered and the abuse that you suffered will be the platform that you stand on one day and God will use you to help other people suffering and you will help prevent all the things that happen to you. You will help prevent them and you will let them know, take them by the hand and say, look, because that happened to you, that doesn't make you dirty in the sight of God. Listen, God can clean you up and God can fix you and God can make you brand new. And I'll tell you, there, there's a reason why Pastor Aaron and I have an anointing to help people in their marriages and I wish that we were good at something else. But the platform that we stand on is the platform of pain that we came from. And we, with all confidence, can say, God can fix you if he can fix us. Because we weren't coming back. And we knew it. And if God can heal us and if God can fix us, yeah, we'll stand on this platform. Because all we can say in this platform is, hey, we blew it and we failed. And, and all the things that we thought we got right, we got wrong. But by the grace of God, we're here. And by the grace of God, it's okay. And I don't know if, if you, your life hasn't worked out this, the way that you wanted it to, but God can take the past failure of your life and God can, can revisit it and God can breathe holiness and fire on it and God can give you a call and God can give you a dream. But when God gives you the dream, you have to understand that the dream, you're still just a loaf of bread. But God can use a loaf of bread and God can hurl a loaf of bread. And I want God to hurl you at the enemy and at the enemy's tent this week. But I want you to understand that, listen, sometimes the greatest suffering you have to embrace and you have to go back to. And every time that we help counsel somebody in marriage, I got to be honest, I don't, know if we'll come, I don't know if I'll come out of that again because it was so deeply painful to me. But I give that gift to God and I say, okay, God, I'll revisit that if it helps them through this time right now. I'll revisit that because, because we weren't going to make it out. But by the grace of God, you helped us and you forgave us our sins and, and I'd be willing to lay my life down to help the next person. And I want to say that during this crisis that we're in, there's so much fear around, but the dream of God, listen to God speak the dream to your kids and God speak the dream to your spouse and God speak the dream to your friends. And you need to embrace that dream and help them fulfill that dream for their lives too. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, pray for every person here today that there's been a, a dormant dream that maybe used to be about us in its immature stage, but Father, I pray that you would cause that dream to come alive again and that when you speak it to us, as, as you're speaking it to some, some, to some people, this sermon is that dream about a barley loaf and you've remembered what it is that God called you to in the first place. And I want to say, Heavenly Father, so be it. Amen. Let it be done according to your word, God, and we will help, we will help everybody that we can fulfill the dream of God for their life, that they find purpose and that they help other people find their purpose. Thank you, Lord, for your wisdom and your power and might through this series. We love you and we love the uh, ability to serve our city and to serve the people around us. Thank you, Lord, that you served us and gave your life for us. Amen. Hey, Venue Church, that concludes our series on Gideon. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that you enjoyed my spin on Gideon's weird dreams. Um, hey, we have some great sermon series coming up here, great series coming up online. I'm doing something called The Fables uh, about the parables of Jesus. And, and how he uses just like simple stories for simple people and um, how he just uses uh, the stories about other people's lives to really show us what's going on in our lives. You are going to love it coming up next week. Hey, it's time to give back to God. And uh, as we uh, provide for God's house, I want to remind you that when you provide for God's house, God is able to provide for your house and God does not want to see his children begging for bread. Heavenly Father, I pray right now as we take up the offering, even online, um, Father, as we click the link and we support the house of God, we support poor people, we support things in our community that, that we are able to fund right now, um, people in need, Lord, we thank you for the ability to do this. We also thank you, Lord God, for multiplying the seed that is sown in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you need help right now, or if you need to give your life to Christ, we just, uh, we just want to help you do that right now. If you need help or prayer or support, just click a link on the side. If you need to get involved in a group right now, now is the time you have nothing but time. So get involved in a venue small group. Get more involved in your church than you did before so that these good habits carry into when we can meet together. Hey, let's talk for a minute about when we can meet together. Um, we're allowed to gather up to 50, but with the size of our church now and with 
The singing restrictions, I'm still scratching my head a little bit about that one, if I'm being honest. How is singing different than talking? I'm not really sure. Uh, but with not being able to sing and not being able to have childcare right now in stage one, uh, we're not we're not going to open church quite yet, but I'll keep you as informed as soon as we know what we're going to do with that. But hey, if you need help, reach out right now. We would love to help and support you. We have one more worship song for you before we leave today. So I just want to say a, a final blessing on you. God, God bless you and keep you. God make his face shine upon you and give you peace in this time. We will see you soon.
just want to feel liberated. I, 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 I just need to feel liberated. I, 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 I. If I'm an instigator, I'm sorry. Tell me who in here can relate. I, I, I. I want to wake up. I want to wake up with you in my beautiful morning. Who can I turn to? Oh, Thank you for it. One last time.